welcome, Milan, and it is an honor and privilege to speak with you today as you share your insights and experiences within the global climate of women empowerment. Milan Mewer, for all of us, we are at the CGI New York. Um, she's a true catalyst and it, when it comes to change and empowerment. President Barack Obama appointed Milan Burby as ambassador at large for global women's issues. The president's decision to create a position of ambassador at large for global women's issues is unprecedented. She mobilizes concrete support for women's rights, political and economic empowerment through initiatives and access to education and health care to combat violence against women and girls in all its forms and to ensure that women's rights are fully integrated with human rights and the development of foreign policy. Ambassador Vervier most recently served as chair and co-CEO of Vital Voices Global Partnership, an international nonprofit she co-founded. Vital Voices invests in emerging women leaders and works to expand women's roles in generating economic opportunity. Ambassador Verbeer served as assistant to the President and Chief of Staff to the First Lady in the Clinton administration and was Chief Assistant to then First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton in all her wide-ranging international activities to advance women's rights, democracy, and peace-building initiatives. Welcome, Mila. Thank you so much. So, your work has been so much in the political um, foreign policy and global climate and uh, with the backdrop of uh, different demographics that you have reached out. Tell us how far we have come into this movement and campaign when we talk about women empowerment. Well, it's an excellent question, particularly since we are on the threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, the world is uh, in marking next year the t 20th anniversary of the UN Fourth World Conference on Women. And you know it was there, since we are here at mm -hmm. the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, that Hillary Clinton, as First Lady at the time, issued those historic words, human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights. And the agenda for action that was adopted there is a blueprint for all of us today. And we are measuring ourselves, as she is through her initiative, No Ceilings, to look at how far we've come on access to education, on access to health care, on women's economic participation, mm -hmm. so vital, women's political participation, and to ensure that every woman is free from violence Absolutely. and has legal rights. Mm -hmm. This is basically the call to action. And as you rightly asked, how far have we come? Well, in many categories, we've made good progress. Mm -hmm. And there's a great deal of data today that buttresses that statement particularly in education, right. although we have to do better in secondary mm -hmm. education. On health care, although we, we are making progress, for example, on bringing down the rates of maternal mortality, right. we still have work to do. Uh, we need to do better on economic participation. We're somewhere in the middle, uh, but particularly in helping women move from the informal uh, workspaces where they do the heavy lifting uh, everywhere in the world to the formal workplace uh, where their work is counted and they can be uh, certainly uh, benefit so much more in terms of their income and the benefits they receive. But also in terms of political participation in which uh, from all the data we have we are not doing anywhere near as well as we need to be doing. Uh, really we have to bring women into positions of decision making uh, in government uh, both elective and appointive, from the local level to national levels, that perspective that women have, experiences, talents. We are shortchanging women not having them in the public space, but we are shortchanging ourselves Absolutely. because they can bring so much benefit to decision making. And of course, violence against women remains a global scourge, mm -hmm. and we have a great deal of work to do in that space. Very interesting. Um, when you speak about um, the development side and you have laid out specific areas of where, how much we have to do and where we are at this point, and when we speak about uh, political representation, it is interesting, um, what is the role of men here uh, when we talk about political representation? 
why is it that women have always been uh, taken a back seat when it comes to these areas of uh, corporate and political uh, arenas? Um, what is the role of he for she um, as a UN campaign and the work that you have done? How far do you think we are progressing in that scale? Well, we very much need men to be partners in all of this. Uh, you know, there is no other way. Men are primarily the decision makers still. Uh, but men and women working together is what will give exactly. us the best outcomes that we all want to see for our society. You and I talk about these as women's issues, mm -hmm. but they're really issues for everybody because when women make progress, when they're fully participating, everybody benefits, men and boys, as well as women and girls. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a very important uh, agenda to be working on. Uh, now, you mentioned he for she. UN Women at the United Nations has launched a major campaign to engage men more in solutions, uh, particularly in violence against women. Right. Men have to be a part of the solution, a significant part. You know, I visited India many, many times, and there are wonderful projects in India to address this challenge, which is a challenge there and everywhere. And I remember a group of young men who were doing skits, and they asked me to help launch this program, uh, where they were taking the roles of women uh, in doing these skits, and men. And, you know, you could see what they were doing, don't harm, et cetera, et cetera. And then the, every time I come back to India, they want to see me and tell me what they're doing. And ultimately what they said to me is the violence is really decreased in our, in our village, in our neighborhood. But we have changed too. We understand to be a genuine man is to model behavior that doesn't engage in violence against women and engages in lifting women up and enabling them to be full partners in the work that we have to do together. And it was a wonderful example of how we need the good men always uh, to be with us. Even in the United States, right. you know, over 150 years ago, we had the first women's rights convention in this country, women seeking their rights, the right to vote at the time, to keep their income if they could earn even meager wages, mm -hmm. to be able to get a divorce if their marriages had failed. And it was men joining the women <coughs> on that journey uh, to the convention. And here at CGI, we started um, the program, uh, this CGI, with a women and girls session that was focused on the role that men are engaged in. And on the stage, we had a corporate representative, a representative of a major international right. institution, a head of an NGO, a social entrepreneur, all of them understanding that no country can get ahead if it leaves half of its people behind. And we cannot make the progress we need to make unless we join together. And getting on this uh, note with the, with the <coughs> extension, that when we talk about women empowerment, I have never seen as, like all of us who work in the advocacy region, that it's not a gender battle at all. It's a, the, it's a family empowerment. It is a national, uh, you know, kind of gross national product. Uh, we are talking about to lift our nations. And being an industrialized and a developed country, how can we not get this message, which is which is very disturbing to many civil societies who are working in this uh, area? Women, on the other hand, as you may have seen uh, working with global communities, um, that they don't see themselves as victims. Can you share your experiences on that? Well, I think you're so right, first of all, that we all have to work together. After all, a bird can't fly with one wing. Mm -hmm. If we really want to create a better world, stronger communities, stronger families, we do have to work together. Uh, and you know what, what you just uh, asked about uh, in terms of uh, the um, women who are women, women who victims. We too often look at women because of, of the violence that goes on, because they are marginalized, because of their secondary status in many ways, just as victims. But I have not met a woman anywhere 
no matter how she has uh, been targeted for unspeakable violence, no matter how she has been marginalized in her society, where she doesn't understand deep inside of her the dignity that she has and the difference that she can make. And I remember one night being in Afghanistan with a group of women who uh, we were going to be engaged in a conversation. Mm -hmm. And the first woman said to me, stop looking at us as victims and look at us as the leaders that we are. Women today have to be the voice for change. They have agency, they have power, but we need to enable them and empower them and support them so that they can succeed in this way. But even in the worst of circumstances, every woman knows that she can make a difference. And look at the world. Mm -hmm. Women are on the front lines of change everywhere. I think our job is to help support them and help enable them so that their talents can be unleashed uh, and that they can have the opportunity uh, to make the difference that they can make. That's absolutely the call of uh, many agencies who are working with the same agenda. Um, what is What would be your message? Because you're so much familiar with the challenges of the civil society working in the women empowerment region. What do you see that they need to change in terms of strategy, in terms of um, their campaigns, that we should do better in the next five years? You know, it's an excellent question. And I think one of the things that we've learned over the years is we have to better communicate what is at stake. Uh, one of the things you and I have just discussed is how women are not victims. If we only see a woman through the lens of victimhood, we can't see her right. for all that she can bring. And I think uh, in this space, we also have to understand that today we are the beneficiaries of a mountain of data and research that demonstrates the evidence-based case for empowering women, for investing in women. Secretary Clinton often says, this is not just the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. It is the moral imperative. It is what every woman should be guaranteed by virtue of her dignity as a human being, that she be able to exercise her rights. But we also know it is the smart and strategic thing to do. And often, if you go to decision makers, most of them are still men in these positions. But many times, if you go in and talk about women's rights to them, no matter where they are, they won't exactly be receptive. But if you can talk to them about the evidence-based case, if you want to grow an economy, women have to participate. If you want to create jobs, women need opportunities, especially as entrepreneurs, to grow those small and medium-sized businesses. If we want to make public policy that helps all of our people, look at what the women in the Panchayats have done in India. All the studies show that they have invested those public resources in ways that lift up their communities, that invest in sanitation, in education, in addressing the critical needs that communities have, safe drinking water. So this is such a benefit to society. I think we need to be very smart about how we talk about what the data shows and the evidence-based case we have. So it is right, it is smart, it is the moral imperative and it is critical for our societies if we're going to be lifted up and we're going to have the prospects of inclusive security, peace, and prosperity for everybody. From um, Africa to India to Latin America, the message is the same, that if we measure or, define or redefine progress um, in terms of how women can impact in numbers, and the data is there for us to support it, um, these kind of changes or the mindset of the men who are the decision makers would change, just as you uh, mentioned. Do you think that we also need to do, this is, a, this is something that we do at the present scale. Uh, what about the proactive? Uh, when we see young boys uh, who are becoming young men, we should be starting from that age to teach them conflict resolution skills, to teach them how women are seen. 
and one of the strongest elements I know that you have worked on is the way media sends the messages about females. So if we kind of give them the tools for media literacy, how far that work has been carried on when you were working at the, as an ambassador? Well, I think modeling is important. If the image we see mm -hmm. uh, in the media or in other ways of, of getting information or getting mm -hmm. our behavioral patterns set, then we're going to emulate those, sure. those mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. We need models of, of true manly behavior. You know, I, I remember hearing about a curriculum in India uh, that the, the Tata company uh, had helped make possible that presented those kinds of models of appropriate behavior. And I think this is something that has to start from the youngest ages, uh, where it is very clear that you don't, you don't abuse women, you don't violate uh, right. women you understand that they are fully capable uh, to engage in every line of work uh, and to participate fully in society. I do think these are notions that have to be reinforced. And our society has to model that to the young men, to the boys, as they are coming up. So what is your message to all the civil societies that you have been working and collaborating with, and the leaders and the women change makers? What would be your message today at the CGI? Well, first of all, that we need to be more effective in the work that we do together. Uh, I think both in terms of how we communicate the urgency and importance of this investment. It is critical for whatever we want to achieve, uh, whether economically, politically, or socially. Secondly, I think we need to learn to work together. Mm -hmm that NGOs, nonprofits working alone, activists working alone, really need to bring in all elements of society. I've spent years working with women, for example. When women from government can come together with women NGOs, with women from the private sector, their voice is so much stronger than if they're laboring alone. Uh, and I think both that ability to collaborate on resources, uh, on competencies, uh, on access, but also on the message we, we transfer and we want others to hear. So even though we may be working on honor killings or dowry burnings or on microcredit or on any number of issues that affect women, really it's all about investing in women and girls for a better world. It's an evidence-based case today. Absolutely. It is the right thing to do. It is the smart thing to do. And that's the banner we should carry. Absolutely. And President Obama just said that there are certain steps that they would take as a government.